Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome uh, to Grand Rounds. Uh, it is really delightful to see you all here. Uh, today's topic is going to be on moderate aortic stenosis, and I have the pleasure of being here with several of my colleagues who I'll introduce. Um, our first uh, speaker will be Dr. Nadir Hamid, and I uh, want to welcome her to our, our group, uh, brand new as of six weeks ago. Is that right? Six weeks, okay, but nobody's counting, right? No. So, uh, so Dr. Hamid comes to us originally from Singapore uh, by way of Dublin, where she received her medical education. She then went to Columbia, where she was one of Becky Hahn's first uh, advanced echo and interventional fellows, and then joined the staff there. Uh, she, uh, since joining the staff, has uh, really uh, quite uh, quickly established herself uh, uh, as what I've just determined to be the, the quintessential queen of quantitation. And so, uh, and you can come up with all different acronyms to make that shorter if you want. Uh, but it's, a, it's a, yes, John's thinking already. Uh, but it is really quite remarkable uh, uh, what she has done for valvular heart disease. And uh, as one of her uh, main roles has been in the quantitation of TR, and uh, at last count, uh, Dr. Hamid has personally read over 5,000 uh, echoes uh, for TR and actually quantitated all of them, not just read. And it's not just a color flow, right? It's something about PISA, right? Something like ERO, something like that. Yeah, it's not just a color flow. So, so, so her expertise in that is really just quite renowned and it's absolutely delightful to have her join us uh, in our group uh, for that. And so Nadir is going to kick it off uh, with a talk uh, on quantitation or echo assessment of uh, moderate air stenosis, and then uh, we'll go from there. So Nadir, welcome. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul, for the lovely introduction. And it's <clears throat> let me pull up my slides. And it's absolutely my pleasure um, being here as part of the MHIF and Oina Health Group. Um, you know, thank you so much uh, for the opportunity to present for this grand rounds as well. And today I'll be talking to you about the modern definitions of aortic stenosis, the frontier. I have no financial disclosures. And as we all know, the definitions for severity of aortic stenosis, I don't have to tell you the conventional criteria that we look for the aortic valve area of less than one centimeter square, peak velocity of more than four meters per second with a mean gradient of more than 40 millimeters per mercury. And as we all know, the literature in the past, historically, the mean gradient has been as high as more than 50. But in the, according to AOR, um, the American Society of Echocardiographic Guidelines, these are the criteria for the definition of severe aortic stenosis. And as we all seen in our clinical practice and all our patients that there are many patients who don't fit in that criteria and what we call as discordant gradient with low gradient aortic stenosis. We've seen it in our valvular heart meetings, such as the classical low flow, low gradient in the bottom left, patients with reduced ejection fraction, the D2 stage. In the middle row, we see a lot of these young women, uh, sorry, elderly patients, uh, women, in particular with hypertension or with paradoxical low flow, low gradient. These are called heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And we've seen with normal flow, low gradient aortic stenosis. And all of these are mean gradient of less than 40 millimeters per mercury. These patients, the other echocardiographic parameters that we look at are left ventricular ejection fraction and also our measurement of stroke volume index as well to fit into any of these three criteria. But in essentially, all these patients with severe aortic stenosis, this diagram shows what is the threshold for these patients having adverse events. You can see in this red um, curve of curvature here that these patients have severe aortic stenosis. They have adverse events in terms of mortality, valve-related symptoms, and essentially cardiac damage, which I'll talk to you in the next couple of slides. But we have seen a lot in our community and in the world with the, in the literature that these two you know, other curves as well fit into the moderate aortic stenosis, as you can see in this diagram here. Now, these patients with moderate aortic stenosis, you can see that they have similar adverse events as severe aortic stenosis, 
And these patients come to us with variable symptoms, and that's because of their aortic stenosis load and their tolerability. And so their events in, in terms of the adverse events are expressed in many ways in our practice. And so it's very hard to pick these patients up. And the question in the community is that, is moderate aortic stenosis bad? Look at the left-hand side of the picture. It is the first article that came out from Strange et al. and colleagues based on the Australian database that showed that the five-year mortality of patients with moderate aortic stenosis have a mortality of 56% as compared to patients with severe aortic stenosis, which is 67%. There's not much of a difference, which means that moderate aortic stenosis is bad. More recently, my colleague actually, Austin um, Augustine and colleagues um, just published in 2022, the clinical outcomes of moderate aortic stenosis based on a couple of multiple electronic database of about 12,000 patients. These patients with moderate aortic stenosis have a high mortality, cardiac death, they present in hospital with repeated heart failure admissions, and also these patients undergo aortic valve replacement. Now, these patients as well, the characteristics that illustrate in terms of moderate aortic stenosis, the characteristics include type 2 diabetes, they have coronary artery disease, they have low ejection fraction, and they actually do have symptoms when they present to our practice. And so the question then begs, why moderate aortic stenosis is bad? You can see on the picture on the left-hand side, uh, sorry, right-hand side, that these patients do have cardiac consequences, back pressure with hypertrophy left ventricle, with the pressure going into an enlarged left atrium, and in the end, causing pulmonary vasculature uh, resistance, and pressure on the right side. And so it is challenging from the echo perspective in terms of diagnosing these patients for multiple reasons which we can discuss. But these patients with moderate aortic stenosis are undetected. And there are fast responders as well, sorry, fast progressors in terms of developing into severe aortic stenosis. And so then they develop subclinical cardiac damage, which I will illustrate in the next couple of slides. They present late to us with all the uh, symptoms. And so we as physicians as well failed not only to detect, but also intervene in these patients at a timely manner. And so enhance really bad outcomes. In terms of cardiac damage, uh, Philip John Aru, um, and colleagues in 2017 described the staging and classification of aortic stenosis and have shown to impair survival. Note, the key point about this cardiac damage is that it is silent. And so that's why these patients present to us at a late presentation with all the cardiac damage. So you can see in the diagram illustrated here, stage one is where there's damage to the left ventricle and then followed by stage two, damage to the mitral and the left atrium enlargement causing atrial fibrillation with back pressure into the pulmonary artery vasculature and hence the final stage is when the pressure loads onto the right ventricle with RV dilatation and RV dysfunction. Note that if any of your patients with moderate AS or severe AS have any of these features, it's not an additive. So any of these variable, if a patient has RV dilatation, they will be considered as stage four in terms of this classification. And so Philip John Roo extended the classification of cardiac damage with regards to the mortality in this group of patients. And you can see over 1,600 patients in this cohort, you can see in the severe aortic stenosis group with symptoms, the one-year death for patients with stage four, which affect the right ventricle, the mortality is about 24% as to somebody who doesn't have any cardiac damage, which is only 4% which means that we do have to work harder in terms of diagnosing this patient with severe AS. Our topic today is moderate AS. How about moderate AS with regards to this classification? Similarly, this is actually one of my cardiology fellow in Singapore, Amanua. We work with, together with um, Jerome Bax in Leiden, looking at the data from Singapore and Leiden, these patients of 1,200 patients. Um, and you can see similarly in the moderate AS group, the five-year death 
of these patients with group four that involve in the right ventricular dysfunction, their mortality is also very high at 63%. So we do need to do better in terms of diagnosing these patients. And the question is, how do we improve the detection of aortic stenosis patient who are deemed at risk based on the staging classification? And I do have to go back to the valvular heart guidelines in terms of follow-up of these moderate aortic stenosis. Look at the middle row. You can see that patients with moderate aortic stenosis, the follow-up recommendation is one to two years. Think about it. And I think we do probably need to follow up these patients perhaps a little bit earlier so that we can detect these patients if there's any presence of cardiac damage. And so a lot of, you know, in the literature, you can see in the bottom row, multiple, you know, literature as to what is the predictors of mortality in moderate AS. This is just a brief summary, the key points from an echo perspective, patients with low ejection fraction of less than 60%, presence of atrial fibrillation, diastolic dysfunction, and if someone has a fast progressor, progression of aortic stenosis, of course, in terms of more than 0.3 meter per second per year, if anybody who has a low stroke volume index have a high risk of mortality in moderate aortic stenosis and other features such as elevated BNP, calcium score as detected by, cal by cardiac CT. And so I'm an echocardiographer we do have to look beyond left ventricular ejection fraction. And I think this paper by Ido in Jays in 2020 illustrates that very well. Basic echo parameters such as uh, besides left ventricular ejection fraction, looking at stroke volume index and also diastolic function of E over E prime. You can look on the right-hand side. This is a schematic diagram, very um, simple diagram of how they evaluate patients with moderate aortic stenosis. So here, if somebody has a low ejection fraction or stroke volume index on the left-hand side is deemed as a high-risk candidate with moderate aortic stenosis. Question then is whether when do we intervene, which my other colleagues, Joao and Paul, will, uh, will talk more about the trials. On the right-hand side, if the patient has normal left ventricular ejection fraction and stroke volume index, we look at diastolic dysfunction by measure of E over E prime. And if it's not elevated, then the patient is of high, lower risk. And of course, if it's elevated, the patient is deemed as intermediate risk. And these uh, Edo and colleagues look at this uh, cohort of patients. And you can see on the left-hand side, that patients with a normal left ventricular ejection fraction and stroke volume index have similar expected mortality as someone who has you know, uh, mild aortic stenosis or normal aortic uh, or no valvular heart lesion. But if somebody who has depressed left ventricular ejection fraction, stroke volume index, or abnormal diastolic dysfunction, you can appreciate that these patients' mortality is very high, even in this group of moderate aortic stenosis. And I don't have to talk to you about global longitudinal strain. What it is, is a hot topic. It's been present in many valvular heart uh, lesion and also in the cardio-oncology space. But you can see in aortic stenosis on the left-hand side, the effects of it in terms of causing left ventricular hypertrophy, fibrosis, contractility, and the effects on afterload. And all these features of aortic stenosis, despite being severe or moderate, it can cause a decrease in longitudinal strain and the longitudinal deformation in aortic stenosis. So GLS is done by speckle-trackle echocardiography. There are multiple vendors right now with improved algorithm that is a simple click on the echocardiography platform in your hospital to calculate the global longitudinal strain in your report. And it has shown in many studies in terms of the uh, low deformation of aortic stenosis, even with preserved ejection fraction, its prognostic value. And more recent studies have shown its prognostic value in patients with reduced ejection fraction and moderate aortic stenosis. And perhaps this is a key marker for aortic stenosis with regards to the timely intervention. And so, how about air, uh, moderate aortic stenosis and global longitudinal strain? So do at all in 2020, look at patients with moderate AS and the effects of global longitudinal strain. 
they have looked at the uh, cutoff of minus 15.2%, anything higher than that. So essentially, the more negative the global longitudinal strain is, is good, but more positive is really bad. And so patients with a more positive of uh, more than 15.2% have a higher mortality. And these include these patients who have underwent aortic valve replacement. And I cannot end this, com uh, this presentation without talking about machine learning and artificial intelligence in echocardiography. There's multiple vendors in the current platform with regards to screening to help improve our detection of aortic stenosis. And this is one courtesy of Empiric, which I work with closely in the last couple of years when my time in Colombia and showed not only in screening and the pickup of aortic stenosis, but ability to surveillance these patients over a period of time, follow up with improved detection and referrals to our physicians as well, so they can get an early timely intervention and monitoring of these patients. The two graphs is an example of our cohort in Boulder Hospital, where these patients were referred early in terms of their outcomes to improve their outcomes once they're referred in a timely manner and follow up as well. And so in summary, before I hand it over to Joao, I think in echocardiography and imaging, the redefining of aortic stenosis in moderate AS. I think it's key in terms of screening, accurate diagnosis and follow-up. I've illustrated the key echocardiography parameters to look at whenever you look at a report besides the left ventricular ejection fraction, stroke volume index, diastolic dysfunction, and global longitudinal strain as well, so that we can easily understand the subclinical damage of aortic stenosis and hence develop new clinical pathways so that these patients are referred early to get their early intervention and good outcomes. And hopefully with machine learning as well, that will help us in this process. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nadir. So Joao couldn't be with us in person, so he's online. John, you have him dialed in? Perfect. Hi, Paul. Hi, everyone. Excellent conversation, Adira. Um, really set in the stage. I hope you can see my slides and hear me okay. Perfect. Thank you. Wonderful. Yeah, so what I have to uh, continue to expand on is how important it is uh, imaging, particularly now as we move upstream into the advance um, into the new group of patients with moderate theoretic stenosis. And some of the disclosures is that Core Lab does a lot of work with other device companies, none of which I got personal compensation for. So when we talk about moderate theoretic stenosis, it's important to divide into the two domains. Now we'll talk a little bit about the valve, but I want to also to talk about the ventricle. In terms of the valve, there is definitely the importance, as Nadir highlighted, for the calcium score. We know that women, for the same degree of aortic stenosis, have less calcium than men and present with severe stenosis. This was a work that we did together showing that it classifies patients very well. But we we'll still don't know what is the ideal calcium threshold when we look for severe stenosis 1300 for women, 2000 for men. But when we talk about moderate aortic stenosis, maybe this is going to be obviously less, it's maybe a thousand or so. And maybe there is still going to be seen the difference between genders. What we show in that work was that regardless whether these patients have severe stenosis that fit high gradients, high velocities, once they have high calcification, they don't do well despite valve replacement. That's even for the concordant or for the discordant. And one thing that I think it's fascinating, and we're working with the groups from Sita Sina with Demni Day and Victor Chang here, is trying to really understand better why do women have less calcium than men, and perhaps it has to do with this, what we see here in red, is the fibrotic score. So this think about that as the evolution of the calcium score of the valve. Now to incorporate not only calcification, as you can see here in bright, but also in dark red, the fibrotic score. And that might allow us to better classify these patients and recognize that maybe even if they don't meet the criteria for the calcium score of the valve, when we combine calcium and fibrosis, they might meet the criteria and we should consider replacing these valves. Now, enough of the valves. If we understand quite well, the myocardium is a bit more complex and that's where we're gonna come into the myocardial structure and function. 
You heard from the dealer about the Genero's staging classification. Philippe Genero and David Cohen now more recently published this article, which is quite opening, eye-opening and very humbling to see that despite fixing the valve, when you look at your changes of staging, how much better did they get after you replaced the valve, they did not improve so much. So the change was none, was lateral move in about 60% of these patients or worsening in another quarter percent of these patients. So are we intervening too late? Are we giving them some quality of life, some quantity to it, but are we really making a difference in terms of the changes that we can capture by echocardiography? So for this, I would like to obviously wear my other hat with cardiac MR. We know that aortic stenosis causes pressure overload over time. And with that, you can see the signature of fibrosis. Typically with hypertrophy comes non-ischemic fibrosis. As we continue to watch and wait for the valve to become severe, the ventricle starts to have other hits. You can see this by illustration, hypertrophy in blue increases. Diffuse fibrosis, which is going to be the collagen to hold the myocytes is going to increase and in replacement fibrosis. Once you do AVR, you can't remove what it's white. You can potentially reverse, obviously, provided that there's no PPM, provided there is no arterial hypertension, some of this remodeling, but you cannot erase what it's already there. You can see a very large uh, cohort from UK, almost 700 patients, that fibrosis by MRI comes in two shapes, either infarct, you can see here, infarct pattern, some of the cardio, or even more, more commonly, the non-infarct pattern associated with hypertrophy. And it's whether or not you only have one type or the other, but obviously the presence doubles the cardiovascular mortality and triples, doubles all-cause mortality and triples the cardiovascular mortality, whether one goes to SAVR or TAVR. And it's not only how much you have that would impact, but we really wanted to drill it down when we wrote this editorial me and Paul was, can we move upstream and consider how we can change this? And this is a trial that is going to be finishing this next year, along with Progress Taver, not Progress, I'm sorry, Early Taver. This is in asymptomatic patients with aortic stenosis by Mark Dweck, showing in the presence of severe aortic stenosis, they would undergo cardiac MRI. If there is fibrosis, they get randomized to just watch or randomized to intervene. And this is going to be very complementary to the other pragmatic trial, which is the early TAVR by Philippe Genero. Now, why is this happening? You know, and we look back into you know, biopsies of patients or even autopsies. You know, back in 1990, patients with severe AS, hypertension, diabetes, and the pathologist described as extensive scarring reminiscent of even cirrhosis at low power. And what happens with severe AS is not only the pressure overload increases the myocyte, but also the glue that unites them, which is predominantly type four collagen. And this obviously causes not only much better efficiency to overcome the pressure overload, Laplace's law, but also comes at a cost of worsened diastolic dysfunction and obviously eventually systolic dysfunction. You can do this non-invasively, with the use of myocardial extracellular volume fraction, using by MRI and had a very good correlation with biopsies. And this has been shown that this is going back almost five years ago when I was back in Pittsburgh in a cohort of patients with moderate and severe aortic stenosis. The pressure of a load in aortic stenosis increases their ECV, increases their interstitial, typically 24 plus or minus two, 24 to 28, 29 in aortic stenosis, then it starts to about 29 and goes up. But even in patients with moderate to severe, there were patients that had normal ECV and these patients had no events. Could this be a better way to actually follow these patients and understand who is going to be at risk? This gets replicated. We contributed to this multicentric study. Same thing, a low ECV is protective, a high ECV is bad, not only for all cause, a cardiovascular mortality, and you can see the same thing. Low ECV has very good protective effect. And when you do machine learning and you combine this with almost a thousand patients with a validation and derivation cohort, you can see that ECV, extracellular volume fraction, in addition to right side ejection fraction and ventricular remodeling are all prognostically important. So we need to listen to the ventricle even before the patient might have symptoms. 
if we wanted to change the natural history of this disease. Now, obviously we'd love to do cardiac MRI, but it's not feasible in everyone. And one thing that we have been working together with a group from Bart's Heart Center with Tom Tribal leading this, uh, starting with the development of ECV, the same measure that we did by MRI here down below, but by CT, because all these patients there on the Gordon Tavern, they need to have their CT. Initially at 10 minutes, but now down to three minutes. And we have been able to do this on a clinical basis every day when we do our TAVR scans. You can see here a patient with normal ECV at 28% focal ECV and a patient that has an elevated ECV with a three minute delay scan at 33%. This is a work in progress by Hideki Koike, uh, doing all, not only the focal ECV, but potentially also the global ECV by which we could capture many more segments. And this is something that we're going to be learning on how this could potentially inform the decision tree. You heard from Nadira, also the potential to use strain as a metric of ventricular deformation. Strain by echo has become very commonplace now, but we still need to be cognizant that it's dependent on the image quality. You can ask the machine to do it, it's going to do it, whether the results are reliable or not. We have to just be obviously um, truthful to not report something that is not accurate. And, you know, and sometimes two thirds of these patients, a third of these patients may not be able to do a strain. By CT, we can do it, um, starting with single source uh, scanners, three quarters of these patients, having abnormal strain is as bad as having impaired ejection fraction. And when you take this into newer technology that we have at MHI with the dual source uh, four scanner with a much better temporal resolution, you can get this done in up to almost 97% of these patients, uh, work that Miho Fukui started uh, back in Pittsburgh and now has really led this field to develop a better metric to track the ventricle. And not only the left ventricle, but I would argue also the right side, which is going to be important for these patients. Looking at what happens after you fix the valve, here's a second valve in the patient with severe AS. You can see that the concentric hypertrophy, that increase in interstitial space that we talked about, makes the heart quite rigid. I mean, it still has preserved ejection fraction, but the strain does not improve. And the lack of improvement of strain is also prognostically meaningful. So we're talking about the structure, but also the function is important. And putting it all together in this work that uh, also Miho has led with my colleague, Philippe Pibarro and many others, multicentric study of 150 patients, each one of these domains, SCAR, ECV, ejection fraction, they matter. And the worst is obviously the patients that has compromises in each one of these domains. Also, CMR can help us detect phenocopies. This was a case that we had a couple of years ago, a patient that was sent for potential HCM. And you can see with the late GAD that this is not HCM. This is actually amyloid infiltrating the atrium, the ventricles, both ventricles, and an infarct. So it looks like HCM but it has nothing to do with that. And that is not uncommon, the overlap of cardiac amyloidosis and aortic stenosis. And we can capture that uh, with ACV as well. We can capture that potentially with the strain, but the strain is not so specific. And that's what we need to be obviously mindful of. And when we're looking to the treatment, these patients should still derive benefit from treatment of the valve. We cannot withhold the treatment but we should treat in addition to the valve, also the ventricle. This is work that we did back when Nadira was in Colombia and I was in Pittsburgh, now we're together, but showing that there is actually no signal of mortality that is increased once you treat the valve, but they tend to obviously have much more heart failure hospitalizations and therefore we need to choose a valve and choose it precisely. We talked about the strain. It is sensitive, but not specific. Other patients can have this apical sparing and not necessarily have amyloid. And when we're talking about ECV, which is a metric of structure and GLS of function, you could say, well, we should just do strain, but actually there is very minimal overlap. This is work that um, Eric Sherbert, who is at United here, and Amiho and many others have done, showing that you know the prognosis of these patients, this is not in patients that have aortic stenosis, but it goes to show that once you have the hit of the GLS, 
and a worse ECV, you tend to do much worse. So both domains are important and there is not significant overlap. How can we detect cardiac amyloidosis on CT? The same thing, ECV, we can do this. Uh, again, work by Tom Tribal that we were able to collaborate. As you can see from blue, it starts from blue and it starts to become green and even yellow. A higher ECV by CT corresponds to a higher uptake on the nucleus scan. And this is a case that we had not too long ago showing a patient that presented to the cardiac MRI with severe paravalvular leak. You can see here on the top left, quantifying that. And you can see the ECV is high, 37%. This is amyloid that was confirmed by PYP. And so triple pathology, severe AS, got treated with TAVR, cardiac amyloidosis probably present even at that time, and also captured by ECV elevation by CT. So this is a robust technique that we can do. And just to finalize the right ventricle, we talked a lot about the left side. The right side also carries the load. And when we look into how does the right side get assessed by echo, we will still be missing. One in four patients, the echo said there was nothing wrong with the right side. The CT captured that. All this information is there. And obviously, at right now, it takes time to do this analysis. But I would like to conclude just with a couple of things here for us to think about how we're going to recruit these patients with advanced imaging and within even the echo. We know that standardization by the it's necessary and guidelines provide that, but the human variability occurs. And so that can delay us in care. When you look into data from 2019, just a couple of years ago, 100 patients that met criteria for severe AS, only 52% of them were called to have severe AS. And ultimately, only third of them got referred. Third of the ones that got initially got treated. So even in 2022 or 2019, and this data has been replicated by the group in Boston, we're still missing a lot of patients along this journey. You need to have a good act. We need to have somebody that interprets well. You need to make some action into this. And perhaps by nudging, say, hey, please refer these patients. Sending echo alerts might be a way that we could capture these patients. We need to obviously bring the awareness this is a treatable disease that we cannot wait. Maybe calibration, how we can do better. Maybe assess where are we doing discrepancies. Are we reporting just the valve error but without gradients? are reporting gradients, the DVI, we need to come up with a consensus so that we can improve the referral of these patients and obviously understand and teach them what is about their valvular heart disease. AI, as Najira mentioned, might help us out. It will save time. It will allow us to focus and put our attention into this. But then I think even more importantly is actually to train. We need to continue our mission to train. We have many more interventional cardiologists and imagers. The ratio is six to one. And it's now time for us to really embrace that if we don't pass it on the baton and move on, uh, we're not going to be able to achieve success. And with that, thank you so much. All right, so thank you very much. And so I'm gonna finish with the discussion about the rationale uh, for why we would consider TAVR or actually any intervention for these patients with moderate aortic stenosis. Here are my disclosures, and the most important disclosure is probably that the, uh, the fact that I'm the national PI for the EXPAND-2 trial, which we're going to cover as part of this morning's uh, presentation. So why TAVR for moderate aortic stenosis? So it's an interesting proposition when we think about this uh, in terms of what we want to do. But, you know, when, when Adira showed you earlier, and Joao also showed you in his talk on uh, CT and MRI, there is an associated impaired survival for these patients who have moderate disease. So here on the left-hand side is one study uh, from a Mainz University. In the middle is a study from the Mayo Clinic. And then on the right-hand side is our own data from MHI, which was published a couple of years ago. And what was interesting is that in each of these studies, there's a significant impairment in the survival. And if you look on the left, this was an all comers in the middle, this is a graph that focuses on just people with normal EF, or I don't know about GLS or anything else, but the EF was reported as being normal. And on the right-hand side, this is our own data. And this is one of several graphs on the paper, but these are the patients who had normal EF with no morbidities, no markers of fertility. And so it's amazing 
that the data is really consistent across multiple different groups of patients. And the annual mortality is really consistent. It's about seven to 8% in all of the studies. It's really, really quite amazing. And so these patients are at risk. And when you look at these patients, they're everywhere. And so, so this is a snapshot from our valve dashboard. Uh, and, and this is a look at patients with aortic stenosis. And you can see that they're grouped according to mild, moderate, and severe. And certainly there are thousands of people, patients I should say, uh, with aortic stenosis. But look at the number of moderates. Moderates are 10 times more than severe. So these are patients we're gonna to have to address one way or the other, whether they're symptomatic or asymptomatic, where they have EF uh, issues or GLS issues, I'm learning the language, or ECV issues. We're gonna to have to figure out some way to address this sizable population. They're not gonna flood our clinics tomorrow, but you can bet that there, as these clinical pathways get established, they're gonna appear in our practice. And one of the challenges uh, with these patients when they present is that there are no guidelines. So if we have somebody with moderate air stenosis and presents with some type of heart failure symptoms, there are no valve guidelines. The only valve guideline there is, is if they need cardiac surgery for one other reason. Otherwise, for isolated moderate AS with HEF-PEF or HEF-REF, we don't know what to do. Uh, we'll put them on GDMT, but we don't know what to do in terms of the valve and therapy. So when you put it all together, it's a pretty easy proposition. You have lots of patients, you have poor survival, and we have no guidelines. So, so if you put all this together, this is the rationale for new trials of therapy. We got to figure out what to do to make it better uh, for these patients who really are everywhere uh, in our practice. And so the two trials uh, that I want to point out are uh, the PROGRESS trial, and this is a, a trial that's sponsored by Edwards. Uh, the national PIs are Philip Jonaru, Raj Makar, and Jerome Bax. And on the right-hand side, I had the pleasure of being the PI uh, in the United States for the EXPAND2 trial. This is being sponsored by Medtronic, and then Joseph Rhodes-Cabot is the PI out of Canada, and Stefan Windecker is the PI out of Europe. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about what the details of these trials are and hopefully get you excited about what we may be able to offer our patients. So when we look at the enrollment criteria for these trials, and this is specific to expand to, but it's really similar for progress. Uh, we're really gonna focus on patients who have moderate aortic stenosis, they have some degree of symptoms and they're at risk. And if you take away those three items, everything else will sort itself out. So on the left-hand side, these are the conventional criteria for moderate aortic stenosis. And those things, VMAX, gradient, valve area, they're a bunch of ands. It's not or, they have to have all three. And the reason for that is because we don't want anybody severe. We don't want anybody mild. They have to be moderate with certainty. In the middle are your classic symptoms that could be heart failure or could be AS. And then on the right-hand side, these are the four criteria that have been consistently shown to be associated with increased risk. So somebody who has been in the hospital with heart failure in the past year, somebody with BMP elevation, GLS, I have to think about this, it's more, less negative or more positive, right? Right, so more positive or less negative. And an ED prime that suggests severe diastolic dysfunction. So if you look at those, they have to have at least one of them uh, with the two on the left-hand side. The other thing uh, about exclusions, so uh, the trial does allow type one bicuspids as long as the aorta is not more than four and a half, but we're not gonna do CVERS zero or CVERS two. Those are, just, those, those are just too difficult. CAD that needs to be treated and in this trial, we also will be excluding amyloid. And I think that's important because there are a lot of patients who have AS, heart failure who have amyloid. And so the way the treatment plan is gonna run is that you have these patients with moderate AS, they have symptoms and they're at risk, and they're gonna be randomized. They're gonna be randomized for TAVR versus GDMT. And the GDMT is gonna include things like Entresto, SGLT inhibitors. It's a state of our GDMT, and we know the benefit of Jardiance in people with preserved EF and elevated BMP. That's already been consistently shown. So it's important to tell our patients that just because you didn't get the valve doesn't mean that you're not gonna do well because GDMT for these patients is actually pretty darn good. 
Then we're going to follow uh, patients for up to 10 years. And the key point about that follow-up is that uh, we're not just following progression of aortic stenosis. Everyone here knows that if you follow a patient with AS long enough, a moderate patient will become severe. That's obvious. We don't need to understand that. But what we're looking for is progression that causes some harm to the patient. And so part of that clinical effectiveness endpoint for these trials, and it's similar for progress, is that if there's medical instability requiring treatment, that could be harmful. And that's what we're gonna be studying. So that medical instability is worse symptoms. So, you know, they go from two to three or three to four. There's some element of laboratory decompensation. It could be pulmonary edema, chest X-ray, some echo worsening, a right heart cath showing elevated wedge, or the BMP goes up. And then all of those things lead to some type of intervention, whether it's SAVR, TAVR, it could be cardiomems implantation or CRT, something that just says we have to address worsening heart failure. And so I think this is the most intriguing part of these trials is that we're going to learn a lot about uh, these, uh, these therapies and how they impact our patients because we're going to study the usual endpoints. We're going to make sure things are safe. We're going to look at quality of life, look at survival. We're going to look at heart failure endpoints, unplanned uh, CV hospitalizations, all those things that you look at in every single clinical trial. But we also have incredible new novel pre-specified endpoints. So all those things that Nadir and Joao talked about, LV mass is a pre-specified endpoint. Isn't that pretty neat when you think about that for a clinical trial? I mean, you can describe these things post hoc in any study, but they actually have it noted up front. It's really unique. Stroke volume index, pre-specified, diastolic dysfunction, BMP elevation, EF change, even new onset AFib is a pre-specified endpoint. So when we, when we say pre-specified endpoints, these are things that we think might be preventable uh, with this trial. And so it's, it's, it's gonna be really important that we look at these and what we will learn. So there's the expand too, and there's also progress. And so progress uh, will be the Edwards trial and that already launched last November. And uh, Bilal is here and he's gonna be the local PI uh, for the United uh, campus where progress will be done. Uh, we'll have expand to here. So we have all bases covered. Uh, there aren't a whole lot of differences between these two trials. They're both two year primary endpoints. The one thing about expand is there's also a 30 day MACE endpoint. And the purpose of that is to make sure that we look at safety because this is an upstream therapy and we don't wanna be causing harm uh, to our patients. So uh, as I go forward, uh, these are the things we ask you to keep in mind. Uh, in terms of moderate aortic stenosis, and then Adira touched on this, the rate of progression is variable. I think we have to be much more proactive about following our patients because it's clear that moderate aortic stenosis can cause silent cardiac damage that's prognostic. It can be associated with impaired survival or it may cause survival. We don't know, but clearly there are multiple studies now. And uh, it, was, it was unfortunate because our previous scholar who, uh, who did the moderate aortic stenosis, we thought this was gonna be a JAK or JAMA paper, but when we submitted it, they were kind of like, well, you're one of 10. And so it, it's, it's, it's everywhere. So the word of moderate aortic stenosis and survival, it's already out. So we have to just accept that. But we're gonna learn a lot about the randomized trials and uh, they'll tell us whether or not TAVR or SAVR will, uh, will be beneficial for these patients. And I can't wait to see what the answer is, but unfortunately it's probably gonna be another five years. So, but, uh, but thank you. And so we're gonna have a panel discussion here and Nadir and Bilal, what's the easiest? Do you want them up front here, John? Yes, please. Okay, so you get to do a standing panel discussion. So we'll be uh, delighted to take some questions. Fantastic. And Joao, you're still online here? Right? Yes, I am. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. All right. Any questions from the audience? Yes. Yeah. Theoretically, it seems like uh, you're, you can know there's an association with mortality, but you don't know that there's any degree and to what degree there's causation. And in addition, a confounding variable about treating severe aortic stenosis is going to be hypertension. Yeah. So, how did you pick the number of patients that you need? to answer these kinds of questions? And which of the surrogates do you think 
would at least help you move this along to a much larger trial. Yeah, and so there, you know, these power calculations are, I mean, we spent a year in the steering committee going through all of the data as best we can, and you just come up with your best guess. And at, at one point, the power calculation was so strong that we only needed 350 patients. And then now it's 750, as you can see. And so um, it is what it is. You know, we, we don't have anything other than best guesses in terms of deciding uh, what, uh, what the power would be. Um, but if you look at that enriched population, those four markers, GLS, EDE prime, heart failure with hospitalization within the previous year, it's like five times higher. You know, and so so we have 90 to 95 percent power, and it, and it's important I didn't discuss this. These are superiority trials, so it has to be better than GDMT, and that's how they're powered. And so, I don't know. I, and if it's a negative trial, then we will guess wrong. So does that answer your question? Pretty much. Yeah. Pretty much. Okay. Yeah. Right. Yes, Nick. So, <clears throat> as a general cardiologist sitting there in clinic. I see a wide variability in echo reads um, in terms of what's called moderate and what's called severe. Are we doing things to standardize that more? That's my first question. My second question is, should everybody with moderate stenosis and moderate aortic stenosis be referred to the structural? Okay, I'll let you do the. <laughs> no, okay, well, the, well in terms of moderate aortic stenosis, I, I think if they have symptoms, Absolutely. If, if you're thinking, well, they're actually doing well, they're asymptomatic. Uh, the progress trial does allow asymptomatic with abnormal strain. So it's actually interesting. So if there are any questions, of course, we'd be delighted to see your patients. Uh, um, but it's mostly symptomatic or uh, symptomatic, some, some degree of impairment. And so you want to talk a little bit about GLS and or echo reporting? Yeah, no, thank you very much. That's a great question. I mean, in all the practices that I've been around the world, um, it's always really hard. There's always discrepancy in the echo reports, not only um, back home in Singapore and Dublin and New York too. And I think, you know, looking at all the parameters, um, not just the ABA, I think really looking at individuals. So what I do is looking at the aortic valve uh, ABA index as well. And, you know, there are some patients with a larger BSA um, with an aortic valve area of 1 or 1.2. But, you know, when you index it based on the body surface area of a guy of 2.2, you're going to get less than 0. 0.6. So really in those gray zones, looking at DI as well, because you have so much variability in echo, especially the measurements which draw can attest to it with LBOT diameter. You can overestimate it and, or underestimation, which is most of the time when there are papers in the literature with measurement of LVOT diameter from CT and doing kind of a hybrid measurement from CT measurement of LVOT with um, the echo parameters of Doppler. And in that group, they measured the cutoff for aortic valve area of severe is actually um, much a little bit higher, the cutoff of that threshold of severe aortic stenosis. And so we in the community in echocardiography is also still you know, there's a lot of discrepancies, but I think really looking at all parameters um, from DI, because it's independent of LVOT diameter, um, we look at the pressure gradient. And you saw in my slide show as well the discordant gradients that we can always get, you know, the paradoxical low flow, low grid. And so what I see, what I think uh, we should do is besides just the ABA, look at all parameters. And if there's any doubt, I would say just call any one of us. Or refer to us, like what Paul said, if there's any, and it's moderate aortic stenosis, I would say just refer, you know, and, you know, we yeah. can look at not only the valve area, but also the CT calcium score as well. Joel, uh, you had a comment? Yeah, I, I, I think, you know, what uh, Nick mentioned is quite critical um, for us to better do, to do a better job and compare with prior studies, look at the images. Um, you know, I wish there was a software that could set boundaries and say, okay, your valve area increase or decrease substantially within a year. There is something wrong with your measurement. It could be even just the, the, the kilogram to pounds that has been replaced, but we don't have such way. Um, Steve Bradley has done some work showing actually that aortic valve area, because it requires three other measurements, is probably the least reproducible. 
um, the velocity, the double velocity index might be much better to track. And so, yes, we need to be critical. We need to look back and compare and really make sure that we are providing guidance to where these patients need to be referred to and triaged. Law, do you want to comment on how you want to handle United referrals for moderate AS? I think that is going to require a significant change in our practice pattern. It sort of forces us to think about aortic stenosis a different way. I think Nick, you bring up an amazing question here because uh, more than severe aortic stenosis patients, we are seeing patients who are don't feel just quite right. They have these vague symptoms of quality of life impairments, and their numbers have gradually trended over the years, but never quite meet the criteria. And we haven't developed this uh, mindset of looking at the more advanced imaging with cardiac MRI and CTs and all the parameters that uh, Nadra spoke about. So I think that we're going to have to redefine how we, um, as uh, you know, cardiologists, need to look at that patient population. Um, you know, between education, um, perhaps more advanced imaging training, um, we may have to sort of uh, expand our horizon a little bit here and see, you know, uh, those patients who we've assumed that this is because of hypertension is the reason for their, their shortness of breath, even though the grades were 27, 28, we really haven't even looked at their cardiac CTs, just focusing on blood pressure management alone. Maybe those patients, we are, maybe we're heading on heading the right direction here. Maybe we need to say, well, is there a possibility that aortic stenosis is actually a significant contributor to this patient's symptom? Uh, and an early referral, I think, would be a pretty one way to bring it. One thing we also talked about in the steering committee was uh, exercise studies. And, uh, but the problem was we had no idea what to do with the data. And, uh, but that's the premise for this, because what we measure at rest, we don't know what really happens when people are walking around. And, uh, but, you know, it's, we think they correlate, but there are probably some patients where it correlates well and others where it actually probably correlates really poorly. And so, um, but it'd be interesting to see if we someday incorporate exercise studies into our, our practice. Right now, I feel like we should think about ECB kind of like the EBCT days, you know, where you know, you walk in and get your calcium score. You should just walk in and get your ECB score. So, yes. Uh, Mijo? So why not sorrowful moderate AS? Because, so we don't know yet the long-term durability of plus factor hyperbow and also tama in tama is graceful, but so you don't know yet the long-term outcome from that. So why not Saber? Or Saber? Yeah. Saber? Um, Saber is certainly uh, definitely possible. It's uh, it's the uh, the concern about enrollment, you know, uh, and just in the current age, uh, having patients enroll into Saber studies, randomized versus medical, uh, that 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 randomization is was a concern, and it's much easier to get patients to uh, be randomized for a catheter procedure versus a, a medical one in that way. So, but there is an age cutoff, uh, so it's sixty-five and older, and so and most of these patients are going to be in their based on the the studies we have, they're going to be in their late seventies and early eighties. They're not surprisingly, they're not going to be young. You know, then so it, the durability issue should not be a concern. Use aortic valve calcium as a clinical help here with moderate AS. I want to know if Joao has any concept of if I do an aortic valve calcium score, what numbers are going to tell me, oh, maybe this is useful beyond something less than severe? How would you create these yeah. new cutoffs? Yeah, no, I think that's a great question, uh, John. And I, you know, when I show briefly that table initially, um, it was around a thousand or so. We did not have enough patients, women and males or females to be able to tell what should they look like. So it's going to be a discovery. The calcium score is going to be acquired prospectively, just like ECV, but it's not going to be an entry criteria. After that is then when we're going to have really new thresholds to inform the field and maybe say, okay, it's not only so much calcium, but calcium plus fibrosis um, that we will be able to ascertain that they are indeed moderate. So are you going to be reporting the fibrocalcific yeah. score now? I mean, tell us, tell us what uh, your so, practice Yeah, this is a work in progress. And a group from uh, Sita Sinai, Victor Chang, um, who uh, was there before um, and um, had some great contacts, also Mark Dweck from Edinburgh. Um, we are you know, working together to have the software available to us. This is going to 
you, you can do the fibrotic, you can only do the fibrotic if you have contrast, but obviously all patients on the gold tower CT, they would have that. So you have the calcium, then you have with the contrast and we'll be able to tease that out. Yeah, as I said, this is gonna be at the back of the envelope uh, calculation so that we can inform. There were some issues with the segmentation, but it seems that the software has improved. Uh, but it, it will be fun to see because the other interesting thing too that I didn't mention is the amyloid doses also infiltrates into the valves. These patients sometimes have actually a very low calcium score. And a lot of that is because of the amyloid in the valve as well. Well, it's uh, uh, almost eight o'clock. And so first want to just th thank everyone for being here. Also want to thank our exhibitors, uh, Amgen and Bristol Myers uh, for helping sponsor Grand Rounds. Uh, and I hope you enjoyed it and just give us a call if you have any questions. And thank you very much. Thank you.